Okay, I'm, I'm going to start then. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you for joining us today on this very, very special conversation hosted by the Firoz Shah Goldrish Foundation. Um, 4th February 2023 was celebrated as World Cancer Day. And the theme this year was closing the care gap. But what does care really mean to people who have dealt with cancer, especially those patients who are faced with this massive challenge in the prime of their lives? How did it affect their personal lives, career, um, education, and more? Without further ado, let me call upon our guest moderator and host for today. She will lead the conversation on closing the care gap with very, very special guests. And before she introduces them and takes this forward, please allow me to introduce her. She's an experienced psychologist posted at Ames in Delhi and works closely with the Indian Cancer Society, a beneficiary of the Pirocha Godrish Foundation. She specializes in pediatric care and post-treatment rehabilitation for young cancer survivors. Please welcome Priya Dixit. Thank you, Priya, for joining us. And I'm going to pass on the baton to you. And uh, we're lo really looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much for having me, Pirosha Godrej Foundation. I'm really glad to be having a wonderful conversation today. So I've been a psychologist for around more than two years, and I've been working in pediatric care for about a year. So I've mostly worked with children, survivors, their family, and I've come to realize that it's a lot to do with the supportive care and the environment that the survivors live in, the diagnosis, post-diagnosis, the rehabilitation. So all of it plays a huge role in uh, the treatment of the cancer survivors and patients as well. So uh, I would like to further introduce you to our speakers next. First up, we have the author of the book, Don't Ask Me How I'm Doing, a book on adulting with cancer. Sanjay himself was diagnosed with chronic brain cancer at the age of 29 when he was about to start his master's at Harvard University. His experience led him to conceptualize this book, highlighting other stories and the unique challenges faced by South Asian people, especially our young Indian adults. Uh, so I would like to welcome Sanjay Desh Pandey. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have someone that Sanjay reached out to while he was writing his book. Um, uh, Mrs. Nehal Pondey. She is a certified career coach and leadership facilitator. She was diagnosed with metastatic brain, uh, breast cancer in the year 2020 and has co-authored the book along with Sanjay, sharing his experience with coping with the disease and discovering herself throughout the journey. Uh, our, le our last speaker for the day has been appointed by our Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji as Fit India Movement's Lifestyle Ambassador Champion. Yeah. Although I'm introducing him, I'm hoping he doesn't need an introduction. He is the author of four best-selling books, winner of several national and international awards. Uh, he's considered the pioneer of integrative and lifestyle medicine. He is the founder of UK Wellness Program, which continues to consult and treat thousands of patients across the globe for cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, cardiovascular issues, autoimmune concerns, obesity, uh, rare metabolic syndromes. So let's welcome Luke Coutinho. Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm hoping to have a great conversation with all of you. So I will start with Luke here. So, I, uh, so your program is uses the word care. I want to know how would you define the word care? And in your experience, what, what are the terms in which the patients and their uh, caregiver seek support? So care for us has a very different meaning from the generic use of care. I've been part of corporate org organizations over the years before I started my practice that spoke about, you know, we care programs, but it had nothing but care. It was just a to-do list and things had to be done and the company and the corporate thought that they cared for people. That made us revisit the actual meaning of care when we started our practice and brought integrative medicine to India. It goes well beyond just, you know, generic kindness, hygiene, and all of that stuff. For us, care is when you have a patient with any disease, we know allopathy in its honest attempt is meant to treat the symptom. But what about the side effects? We want to also look at the side effects. We also want to look at the collateral damage that those side effects are causing. 
we don't want just to we don't want to look at a patient going into remission. We want to see what can be done to keep the patient in remission. So all of these little things, we want to see how we can rope in the family because the families in India are very, very different from families in the United States of America and other countries. For them, it's still a taboo. Some patients, young patients, are not allowed to tell people they have cancer because of fear of, you know, their parents won't be able to marry them off and stuff. So there's a lot that goes into care where we try to educate and teach family members how to be supportive and, you know, to keep egos and prides and, you know, superstitions aside. So care goes beyond this. For us, care is time. Because I know, and it's not insensitive, doctors are very, very busy and they may not be able to give time to their patients. But in our practice, we want to make sure that we can listen and talk to people. Because I think the original meaning of care, there are many things that come with care. One is listening. Listening. Experts usually know everything, but sometimes there's a lot of healing and listening as well. So these are all the aspects of care that goes into detail. It's never just a food plan. It's never just a medicine. It's emotional wellness. It's sleep. It's past childhood trauma, it's suppressed emotional internalization, all of these things going that extra mile is our definition of care. Thank you for that. Um, my next question is to Sanjay. Uh, you have got so many stories together, Sanjay, with your book. I want to know when did you realize that in India there is a cancer care gap? What do you have to say about that? And what is the changing trend for better in India? So I got diagnosed in September 2021 in the US on the day I landed on my um, Howard University campus to start my master's program. And I flew back immediately because I needed to get treatment. Treatment in India is far more, um, how do I put it, affordable. And in some ways, when it comes to surgery, far better than treatment in the West. So um, I came back to India, I got my surgery and luckily I did not have to get any chemotherapy or radiation done immediately. And while I was rehabilitating, learning how to use the left side of my body again, because the tumor was in the right side of my brain, um, I spent a lot of time trying to find support and like um, help for people like me and both in terms of being a brain cancer survivor uh, as well as a young adult with cancer, um, I actually couldn't find anything. And in fact, it took me so long to find one another person who's less than 40 years old who I could speak to about being a fellow cancer patient survivor. So, and that really blew my mind. There are many, um, how do I put it? There are many WhatsApp support groups uh, for cancer in general and sometimes for specific types of cancer. But most of them have either uh, pediatric cancer, parents of pediatric cancer patients, adolescents and caregivers, uh, pe people who have cancer in their adolescence and their caregivers, or geriatric cancer patients and their caregivers. Um, so there is no place where I could find anything for a young adult. I couldn't even find another young adult to speak to. But uh, internet, of course, was a a savior for me. I found a bunch of resources from the West, obviously in the US, in Europe, and in Australia, uh, where there are certain resources and like material available for people to read and understand how they can cope with the, not just the diagnosis, but the treatment and life after, right? Like the life after bit is the least spoken about in the cancer community. But yeah. for me, that has been the most difficult part of my experience that, yeah. okay, I had to put one foot in front of another during the treatment because I was like, okay, I've been diagnosed. Now I need to get my scans. After my scans, I need to meet the doctor. I need to meet the doctor and decide the date of my surgery. I need to get my surgery and now now get, get into rehabilitation. So I had no time to really think about what has happened to me. I have incurable brain cancer and all my plans at the age of 29 were thrown up in the air. So, and there was no roadmap or like, guidance of any sort that was available for me so that was the near that was the care gap that i noticed which is that in especially india and southeast asia south asia in general there is no care provided to this audience which is the young adult patient group patient survivor caregiver group and uh, it creates a lot of issues like all the advice i could find in the west was not culturally uh, appropriate for people from India like 
some advice in the West said that if you are having a hard time with your family, draw boundaries. And I'm like, I live in a two bedroom house with my family where like my parents need to use the bathroom in my bedroom. How do I tell them, give me some space and slam the door shut on them and see like, okay, I can't deal with you right now. It's impossible. So there were obvious, obvious culture nuances that were missing in these resources that I found in the West. And I thought that, okay, if this doesn't exist, and I've been uh, extremely fortunate to have survived this. Uh, I am going to do something to give back to the community that I now belong to. Uh, not just for people who currently have cancer or are in treatment or are survivors, but to those who will come in the future. Because God knows the number of young adults with cancer in India and everywhere in the world has been increasing year on year. And this is going to be helpful. So that is how I decided that there's a core gap that has not received enough care, is completely underrepresented and completely underserved and needs to be given some sort of care. Yeah. Well, that was a slightly different question for you here. Uh, what do you think about the emerging support groups that have evolved nowadays for these populations? Do you think they also play a role in cancer care? while they are in treatment or post-treatment, young adults, survivors, parents, there are a lot of support groups that are emerging in India, especially when it comes to cancer care. Um, yeah, I agree. There have been a lot of support groups. Unfortunately, in my experience, might be limited experience, um, they weren't very helpful in terms of being a young adult cancer patient. Like my questions and concerns were like, should I go back to work now? Or should I go back to study now? Should I go back to the dating game? How am I going to find a partner? Um, what about like moving countries? Like I had decided to start my life in another country completely. And now I'm back with my parents and completely lost my independence. And I'm mostly bedridden and like bound to my home and like attached to my parents at the hip and like at the mercy of my doctors because I have to get scans and tests every six months done. And that decides whether I get to dream big enough to think beyond a year or not. So those concerns honestly haven't been answered. I'm not saying that support groups are not useful and they haven't been coming up. They have been coming up a um, dime a dozen, but uh, I don't think they're targeted in their, um, in their services. I think what ends up happening is that people lump all cancers together and say, Ki, let's create a cancer you know, support group. There are more than 120 different types of cancers and mm -hmm. more than four different grades and stages of cancer. And each person's cancer has different molecular and genetic mutation. So to just say that, hey, we have a cancer support group for you and put all people there and say, hey, meet each other, find your like peer buddy, your cancer coach, and like talk about your issues is in some ways uh, limiting in terms of being helpful and beats the whole purpose of having a support group to begin with. So that has been my experience. On the other hand, though, I do believe there are a lot of health tech companies that have been coming up, which yeah. provide very focused care uh, mm -hmm. in terms of like the challenges you're facing. And yeah. they have been very helpful. So one of these health tech companies I do not wish to name uh, helped me with like coming up with an individual diet plan, uh, which was holistic in nature for my own type of cancer and grade of cancer. And they also helped me put in get in touch with another person uh, who had the same type and grade of cancer of my own age group. So. Yeah. I do believe that there are a lot of for-profit social enterprises in the health tech space that are trying to change the game. So in that way, yes, like the, uh, the situation is changing in India. Just adding a disclaimer, my experience yeah. is limited to India. Uh, Sneha's in Singapore. She will be able to talk about how things might be different in Singapore and perhaps be even more advanced. But for me, at least in India, it was fairly challenging. Yeah. So my next question is directed towards Nehal here. So a lot of mothers have joined us today in the live session by Purocha Godrej Foundation. And they'll be able to relate and understand with your journey better. 
uh, tell us how you dealt with the entire experience as a young mother. Your experiences are totally apart from the rest of the population here. When did you realize that there was a cancer care gap for you? Um, so I think Priya, for me, uh, having my son uh, just before I got diagnosed was a blessing. I think he became my one of my main reasons to really, you know, go through this. He was my biggest distraction, my biggest reason to smile. And I had my fears similar to like a first time mom. Am I a good mother? Uh, am I a bad mother if I'm not being able to breastfeed him? A lot of things. But um, in terms of the support networks that we talk about, you know, you need a, they say that you need a village to raise a child. I, I think I just had these two fantastic women in my life, my mother-in-law and my helper. And I think they did a, did something like way beyond what, you know, even I think I could have done. Yeah. My mother-in-law was with us for about two years and it really made me realize that it's okay to ask for help. You know, we don't need to be superheroes and super women all the time. Um, but one conversation, I think, really changed the game for me. I, it was a conversation with my husband. I was really feeling low. And uh, the only thing he told me was that, Snail, to give your child the life you want to, you need to put yourself first now. And I think that pretty much changed a lot of things for me because we always put others first as women. And I think everyone, you know, it's a, it's a way that we, you know, believe that it's other needs, our kids our husbands, our families, and things like that. And uh, that was a sort of cancer care gap that I can say, because uh, when I got diagnosed in Singapore, okay. they immediately put me onto this uh, Breast Cancer Foundation under 40 women's group. And I was journeying with somebody who had cancer, like me, for three months. So it was almost like my induction into cancer with somebody who had it. So she was answering all my questions. She was there for my fears. She was there for everything. She didn't make me feel lonely. Now, these sort of experiences, I did not see for everyone. It was not something which was standardized, especially in India. And the kind of support I received that way. And another was just being okay, seeking mental health help. Yeah. You know, it, it sometimes is a taboo when, you know, you say that I need help. And uh, receiving that sort of help was also something I felt that not many people do and not many people get. And which is so important to really face it because cancer is a huge mind game. As much as it is a game of the body, it is a lot to do with the mind as you know, Luke mentioned. Thank you for that. Uh, my next question is to you, Luke. Uh, in your experience, what do you think are the most crucial things that the non-profit or the profit organizations or even at individual level people are doing when it comes to cancer care and support uh, what are the most common questions that come to you regarding cancer care just as Neil mentioned that uh, mental health is one of the most important topics nutrition is one of them what do you have to say about that yeah absolutely you know we need to break it down because the world has become very easy easily guided into following trends and herd mentality, like even the term support group, it fails at every level when it comes to mental health. Because, you know, like Sanjay rightly said, you know, I'm part of a group with people who have other cancers, different geographies, different childhoods, different ways of handling stress. Everyone has a different threshold. You know, I, I believe the main reason survivors survive is, yep, their medication, lifestyle changes, but their mindset. People with the same cancer pass away. It's a difference of giving up and mindsets in most cancers. The point is when you put someone in a support group, everyone has a different expectation from a support group. And at the same time, what is the intention of that support group? Every cancer is so different, even if the stage and the type is different, because it involves a human behind it with fears and different emotions. So like Sneha rightly said, mental health has to be individualized. It can't be through a support group. It can't be that way. A support group is great as a guidance group. It helps you move into different areas that you need. So we work with hospitals in the US. We, hope we work with hospitals in the Middle East. Each one has their own coping mechanism. But what we've learned over time, it needs to be individualized. And that's where support groups and cancer care groups have the primary responsibility of number one, create education and awareness. Because the moment you take away all the wrong information from the internet, people's opinions, people's thoughts and theories, a lot of fear automatically goes. Like the biggest fears people got, am I going to die, Luke? And I'm like, uh, yeah, of what? Your cancer? Yeah, I have cancer. No, you can also die on the road today because road accidents are more than the deaths of cancer. You know, there's so much fear because of misinformation. 
So I believe that groups should always, the way forward in any, any disease or any aspect is awareness and right education through groups. That, okay, everyone believes that, okay, genetic cancers, there's nothing you can do. Wrong information. That's why epigenetics is working today, because there is a possibility. Everyone believes that cancer treatments will have serious side effects. Yes, they do. And in many cases, patients don't even go through one of those side effects. What's the difference? Same drug. So you see, there has to be a lot of awareness and support groups have to mm. teach people Give them techniques and tools on how to manage fear, anxiety, how to identify your anxiety, how to link emotions. Like, of course, Sanjay is right. India is very different. You know, boundaries and stuff like that have to be, you know, you can't expect people to draw boundaries with close family and especially joint families in India and stuff like that. We have bigger problems. We have problems of too many aunts and uncles telling you what to do. And if you don't do it, it's a big problem. They feel emotionally that you're not listening to them and you have that own stress. So I believe these problems can be sorted out with education and awareness, coming down to nutrition as well. Nutrition, most people have just picked the surface of nutrition. You know, Google the 10 best foods for cancer. Oh, this makes sense. Let's go to PubMD and check on green tea. Oh, green tea has a few peer reviewed studies. It isn't like that. The biggest education gap right now is, yes, we know why cancers happen, but ask anyone today, they say, oh, we don't know. We, of course, every doctor and every specialist who has gone deep enough knows why a tumor forms, whatever cancer it is. Okay, they know it's multifactorial. They know it's a breakdown in your angiogenesis defense system, period. Now, there could be 50 or 100 reasons why the system broke down, but at least the patient now knows that, hey, my cancer, any of the cancers are caused because my blood vessels don't know when to stop growing. And the point is now you have information. You know, lack of information is fear. Now, how do I improve angiogenesis? And there are 50 or 100 options over and above just chemotherapy radiation. So what is this? This is hope. It may not work. If it worked, then everyone would live. But there's hope and there's possibility. So I believe support groups, all of this nutrition as well is overhyped. There's good medicine, bad medicine. There's good nutrition and bad nutrition as well. There's good Ayurveda and deadly Ayurveda. The point is, how do we standardize awareness and education? And this becomes the fuel of support groups, which then moves people into certain paths. Like, you know, I have patients who get depressed in a support group because they see other people doing well. And all of a sudden they feel they can't do as much as they're doing. So you'll have someone saying, I'm running marathons and I never got my breast cancer back again. And I'm whatever. And someone else who can't even get off the bed now feels that I, I should be running, but I can't run. So you see, it's a very sensitive topic. I believe they should focus more on education and awareness and empower people to make decisions and choices from the awareness and education that they get. But these are the most common questions in India. Am I going to die? What's going to happen? Is it going to be painful? Where's my dead body going to go? Is it going to be reincarnated? People have genuine fears. And sometimes just by talking about it, oh, we'll have patients who have a clean PET scan, but they'll come and say, look, it's all over. The astrologer told me I have two months left to live. These are real problems that we have in a country where you have a clear PET scan, but an astrologer told you you're going to die in two months. So the patient comes back with more fear. So, you know, I think awareness and education, because if you try to individually solve problems, it's never going to be accurate and enough. So that's how I believe support needs to trend. And it is changing. We were with the Indian Cancer Association in uh, Delhi a couple of days ago. I met a couple of ladies at the Oncology Summit, and they were speaking about just this. How do we educate people? Simple fundamentals, you know? And then, of course, like Sanjay said, can we move into dating? Can we move? All of that has to be answered. It can't be a taboo. It can't be things that can't be spoken about. But I believe a lot more structure will make it way more easier. And I'm taking a lot of points from you, you know, on how we can implement these things in our, especially in the government hospital setup where the influx of patients, such patients is just so much, where they come with a lot of misinformation as well, as you mentioned very correctly, how to go about it. <clears throat> Thank you for giving me that. Thank you. Uh, so Sanjay, you had a very interesting point in your book where you mentioned that language matters a lot, how in perceiving others and yourself, you know, so how would you describe someone with cancer, whatever you have written regards to language, how does it matter in you in perceiving people, could you share some more light on that? Sure, so language and vocabulary essentially help you articulate these feelings that you feel but aren't able to express in any other way, right? So 
a lot of terminology that cancer patients use to get through their treatment is very personal to them. Some people like being called patients because they're going through active treatment. Some people like being called warriors or like, you know, battlers or whatever, because they want to use that language. Um, some people want to call themselves thrivers because they've come out of the treatment, they've beaten cancer and now they're flourishing or thriving. And some people just like to call themselves survivors. And now survivor because they have come close to death, stared mortality in size and have realized how important their life is and have survived that entire experience. Or just because it's the easiest term to use with lay people. Now, lay people may not understand things like uh, living with cancer, but currently tumor free. Or let's say in maintenance treatment, right? Like it's not language that a lot of people will understand. And within the cancer community itself, uh, there is so much inconsistency of understanding of different vocabularies. And people don't agree on one universal term or terminology at all. Like I personally hate calling myself a battler or warrior completely. Because with the battle language, what ends up happening is that we put blame for someone who's unable to deal with their cancer uh, on that person. Think about how we describe people who die because of cancer, right? We say, oh, this person lost their battle to cancer. Why they did not lose their battle to cancer. Cancer is just a disease that happened to them. They gave their best, but unfortunately, everyone has to die one day. And this was unfortunately their turn. And sometimes you can do everything possible and still die. I mean, um, I don't think there is anything to be ashamed of in admitting that, hey, you know what, I'm doing my best. But this disease is still like, you know, affecting my life. It's okay. You don't constantly have to be a fighter or a thriver. And think about it. Why would you fight your own body? Cancer is a part of your body. It's not an external disease or an external virus. Some cases it is like some cancers are caused by external viruses, right? Like HPV causes cervical cancer. Now, in that case, sure, you can say that, you know, there is an external virus that needs to be dealt with and hence, you know, you say, I'm going to fight this virus. But in my case, I have brain cancer and technically allopathy doesn't know what causes brain cancer. And I can't really say like, oh, I'm going to fight my brain and be like, why did you give me incurable cancer? Now I'm going to fight with you and like stay longer alive than you would have let me like, you would have allowed me to live. So identities and how you resonate with identities are difficult to predict even within the cancer community. For instance, now, I used to call myself someone who was living with um, uh, someone who was living with incurable brain cancer. I've stopped using that language now because I've realized that the more number of times I keep telling myself and others that I have incurable brain cancer, I'm technically telling my own body that you know what, there are no hopes left for you, right? So I've stopped using that language, but I don't deny the reality that my tumors are going to come back. When they come back is not in my hand. I don't know. Nobody can predict, neither can my doctor. But it's a chronic form of brain cancer. So it will keep coming back. At least statistically, mm -hmm. that's what is the reality. And it might eventually take my life. Or perhaps, like Luke said, I might be walking on the road and die. The cancer may not really, the cancer may not be the cause of my death. But... Uh, Living in the fear of death in itself is what causes people to not embrace the reality. Yeah. So I think for a lot of people, the struggles that Luke was describing is embracing this reality and identity that they have now, that they are a cancer patient or a survivor uh, per se, right? So that's that's something that takes a lot of effort and not many people are okay accepting their mortality. Yeah. Um, so Luke, how would you advise people to look at care for their loved ones who might be living with cancer now? What advice would you like to give? So it's just be there for them. The most healing, if you're not a doctor, you don't have an expertise like nutrition or whatever, 
be there for them, listen to them, be there to support, don't sympathize, empathize, and keep unnecessary advice out of the situation. The beauty of care is, do you feel cared for? Is the question that every patient or every caregiver should ask their patient. Do you feel cared for? For that, it could be just someone holding their hand, making sure their meals are on time. We don't need excess you know, information. What Sanjay said was beautiful. These terms are meaningless. Yeah. That, that means, what are you fighting as a warrior? It's not a fight. It's your own cells in you. There is nothing to fight. A virus at the same time is also making you stronger for future, you know, events and stuff. But everyone has their own words. So some people, it motivates them. But then the warriors, what does it mean for other people who are unable to? Does that mean they're weaker than warriors? Does it mean that they don't have the ability? Now they feel that negative pressure that I'm not fighting enough. How can yeah. you fight? You're told to go home and rest because the healing will happen when you rest. You can't be fighting. So it's different for everyone. Like if I term cancer, I remove human emotion and label. It's nothing but I have an imbalance in my body. My immune system has failed on me right now. And yeah, I'm doing what I need to take over. It's as simple as that. But humans love bringing emotions and labels and terms. And it, it, may, it may inspire you to say, wow, I've caught this because I have a warrior spirit. And it's good for you, but it doesn't have to be good for everyone else. So care is, you know, we always assume what care is. Today, there may be many people watching this. Walk up to your partners or your siblings or your family or your lovers and just ask them, you know, what makes you feel cared for? You'll be surprised what people say. It will be completely different from what you think you know makes them feel cared for. And sometimes when we speak to our patients, they're just like, you know, just ask my son to call me up. I just want to talk to him. Ask him to give me a little more time. Or they're like, you know, just let me let me be for a while. I want to listen to my favorite music or get my grandchildren to be. But we as you more care. I'm calling up a doctor at Sloan's, Mount Sinai. Okay, I spoke to someone in Mayo Clinic. I know the intention is there to help, but that isn't care alone. Ask the patient or the person what makes them feel cared for. True. I know all of us assume that we think we know what people want yeah. to feel loved and care. Just ask the other person. It's like asking a child. We all think we know what children make, what makes children happy. Ask your children and you'll be surprised. It won't be anything that you think it is. So, you know, I mean, all these labels, because then it actually we have a big, we have a lot of problems with that. You know, we'll have patients going for marathons right after their cancer and sending the wrong message to other people. I mean, by biologically, you got to rest. You can run marathons, but right now you got to rest. Your body's recovering at the right time you exercise. But just because you do it, you have a couple of Instagram pictures up. You've become a hero now. You make other people feel that I can't do this. And you just send distorted information. And that's where awareness and, you know, education comes in. So care is, I don't know how to care for my next patient, but I ask them. What makes you feel cared for? What can we do to make you feel better? Sometimes they'll say, hey, look, on Saturday, can I have a slice of chocolate cake? Of course you can. It's not going to be the reason your cancer comes back, but you eat a chocolate cake every day. Forget about cancer. You're going to have diabetes. The point is ask, communicate, yeah. touch. Power of touch is so important. Just putting your hand, you know, oxytocin is generated when there's good touch, of course, not bad touch. But the point is, the, this is care. It can't be defined by any university or any expert in the world. It's what we find. It's what we find when we ask and communicate with our patients. Mm. I think we need to empathize with the perceptions of the other person before we put anything on them. It becomes really forced. We need to level it down to their perception levels instead Absolutely. of making it our own. Yeah. How would you say lifestyle choices and nutrition, do they go hand in hand when it comes to cancer care? It's everything. It's everything, Priya. You know, for the longest time, and, and that's why I'm very wary of science. There is great science and there is super science. But all the science that human beings need to be empowered to make decisions when it comes to disease and cancer hasn't reached the limelight. Only the research and the science that people want us to know reaches. There has been research for 15 years plus talking about 80 to 90 percent of the cancers being caused by poor lifestyle. But there's also science that says that we don't know. But people choose to, you know, follow that research because it reaches the limelight. We know for the longest time that sleep deprivation, it's medically connected with cancer, chronic sleep deprivation. But that doesn't reach the science that is fed to the curriculum in, you know, allopathy or even nutritional science for that matter. We don't get to learn what the truth is so that we can educate people that, hey, 
something as simple as lifestyle can be the game changer in your disease. But science will only push the, the worst case possibilities, statistics, numbers, put you in a box. But where's the science telling people today, sleep better, eat better, move according to the disease that you have? Where is science telling you have hope? Because we as pharmaceuticals use placebos, which means they work. Where is all this coming? It's the missing point. That's lifestyle. So I love allopathy. It, people will die without it. But the biggest breakdown is everyone working in silos. Emotional health has to work with physical. Allopathy has to work with nutrition. Everyone has to come together with one common goal. What is the best for the patient or the person in front of us? And that's what it is. Lifestyle is everything. It's everything. People blame cancer on food and oxygen and air. Then all of us should have lung cancer, but we don't all have it. The pesticides and food should give all of us colorectal cancers, but we all don't have it because it's multifactorial. And this is the kind of education and awareness that we hope will come to the mainstream very, very soon. Okay. Uh, so one last question to you, Luke. What will you recommend to our young adults who are suffering with the disease at the moment? Okay, number one, okay, when anyone, it could be a kid, I had a, I had a four-year-old boy yesterday who was uh, 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 with, a, with a brain cancer and stuff like that, whatever the age is, number one, do not go onto social media to find your answers, find validation and attention, okay, because you can, you get a ton of likes, but you feel empty after that because they're not real people. Immediately go and look at your resources, the closest people that can help you through this, which is either family, if you don't have family, you know, maybe a support group or a friend or a partner, it's okay to ask for help. It is absolutely okay to ask for help. Ask direct questions, never from a space of fear. Can I date again? Will this, you know, affect my sex life? Will I not be able to have children? Ask these questions, okay, so you get clarity not fear. When we don't have information, the point is today, most people with or without cancer literally live in fear because they don't want to ask questions. They don't want to be their true authentic self. Be your authentic self because even people who are not being their authentic self are not being accepted today in society. They have to try so hard to be accepted. Just be yourself. Yes, I have cancer. I have an imbalance, whatever. I'm looking for help. Can you help me? Attitude is everything for a teenager, an adolescent, or a 90-year-old person. With that. You decide what you get to do with your life. You decide how the outcome of the disease is going to be, even if you're a statistic right now. Like Sanjay mentioned, it's an incur incurable cancer. It may come back. It will come back. He gets to decide what happens, not the statistics, because I believe with his kind of cancer, he's already overcome a lot of those statistics, which have probably not come true. So I think today the world is looking to see what decisions other people can make for them, emotionally, mentally, and disease. No, we can accept a prognosis, but the prognosis doesn't have to become the final verdict. Because why am I speaking? I have, I'm speaking with conviction. I don't have a magic diet or a vaccine, but we've seen hundreds of patients around the world with the worst cancers, with the worst cancers, continue to live. So what is that? All I'm trying to inspire people is with hope, possibility, and faith. We don't know destiny. Anything can happen to us tomorrow, but that's out of our control. So focus on what's in our control. You know, dim the noise that you hear from social media and opinions and, oh, he had cancer, he did this, maybe you should do this. No, you find that strength within you. Like cancer can break the body, but it can never break your spirit. And it shouldn't break your spirit. And then do, like Sanjay said, I like it. He's doing all he can now. Whether the tumor comes back or not, or whether he dies or not, that's it. That's what's keeping him alive with a happy face right now. And that, that's, that's what I believe is going to be his healing crowd. So this is what we can do. Do not go to the internet. The internet is not information. It's opinions. It's not facts. It's opinions again. And a lot of it is fake information. Ask people who give you logic. When a doctor is telling you something, ask questions. When a nutritionist is saying, eat, eat black beans. Why? You want to know what function it's happening on the body. Because then with clarity, you have so much of fear that moves away from your body. So nothing's in our control when it comes to life and death. Absolutely nothing. What is in our control are the things that we can do right in front of us. Using common sense. 
I'm sick. I have a problem. I need to eat better. I need to move. I need to sleep better. I need to look at emotional health. And that's it. These are the fundamentals. Let me take my medicine, manage the side effects of my medicine. Build your path. Build your path. But Sanjay, I have a personal request, not a request for you, a suggestion for you. Don't look for the emotional support in common support groups. Okay, maybe get a counselor, someone who you can really, because you have a very different mind and like that many people will be, and they will be able to, according to you, your personality and your character and the suffering that you've gone through, like, you know, landing at Harvard and having to come back. It's a personal journey. Invest in that. That would make the biggest difference because a lot of our patients in support groups, like I said, some get benefits, some don't, but you're on a different path. Take that journey if you have to. Yeah, thank you, Luke. I already have a therapist that I've been working with for a while now. Yes, it definitely helps. I think the reason I bring up support groups is because uh, being a survivor is a very lonely experience because Absolutely. all your friends around you are living up their lives and there is a lot of FOMO, fear of missing out that you go through. But there are also times where you feel like, okay, it would have been nice to speak to someone who either is going through this experience or has been through this experience and relates to the struggles that you have, no matter how well intended, uh, well intentioned, well intended your friends, family, and close ones are, including your partners, uh, they will never understand what you have gone through as a patient, patients and survivor. So right. they might end up saying things that might trigger you. They might saying things, right. end up saying things that might offend you. They might end up saying things that might make you feel baffled like how the hell does this person not see what they have said is hurtful or like is insensitive or is like completely out of their mind like what are you even right. saying like I get a lot of toxic positivity so mm -hmm. people when they realize that I've written a book like six months after my uh, surgery they're like oh my god you're an inspiration you're a role model and I am taken aback. I'm just like, no, I did this for myself. Like, I'm sorry. I'm also a little selfish here. A, I did it because I needed to recuperate from my own emotional and mental uh, wreck that I was right after my cancer. And B, I did it because uh, I want to leave a legacy behind. So I'm a little selfish that way. So not many people accept that. Not many people acknowledge it. I'm okay accepting and acknowledging it. And I think sometimes... If you can't find community, you build your own community. Build it. Absolutely. I try to build my own community. Oh, great. Very inspiring talking to you. And don't care about what people say. You can never make me yeah. happy. Sometimes you're all close people. So that should never be our goal. Be your authentic self. That's how it should be. Yeah. 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 I've taken a very few, very a lot of great points from both of you, including Snehal. And I want to thank you both for joining this conversation, which was initiated by Pirochha Godrish Foundation. It was a lovely conversation. It was wonderful talking to all of you. And I've taken some great insights that we can implement here at hospitals with the pediatric population as well as the adults. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Priya. Thanks, Priya. Thanks, thank everyone. Bye, Sanjay. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. This was a lovely experience. Thanks for having me. Thank you.